Charm Debugger, an important tool for uh, understanding our code. The debugger will allow us to view the execution of the code. It's something that we're not normally allowed to do. We only get to see the outcome unless we put in a bunch of print statements. We're not going to really know about what the code is doing until it's done. For this exercise, I've um, uh, completed uh, the in-class 2.21 lab exercise. Uh, you can use that as a starting point or you can just go ahead and uh, and type out this code if you're interested in following along with my demonstration. As I mentioned, the uh, execution of code is not entirely clear to us when we do it. It runs way too fast. It doesn't really show us anything about what's happening. It really just shows us the result of print statements. Now you can use print statements to debug, and I often do. It's actually my preferred way. I just stick print statements in various places to indicate the values of variables so that I can see uh, how things are progressing. For example, this printing of counter shows us the value of counter for each iteration. It basically also shows us that the while loop iterated four times and that, uh, uh, that the value of counter incremented by one each time. That's something that you can deduce by reading the code, but especially as code gets more and more complicated, it can be difficult to know exactly what the code is doing and in what order. And as I've mentioned to you before, there are two main things that we need to keep in mind at all times when we're uh, evaluating our code or writing or reading code. Uh, and that is uh, the value, the type and value of variables, um, and also which lines are executed in which order. So which line is executed next and what is the type and value of variables? These are the two awarenesses that we always want to be uh, um, uh, keep in mind. We, as I said, we certainly can mentally run our code and say, okay, counter is zero, zero less than four, counter is now one, print one, uh, one less than four is true, counter is now two, uh, print two, etc. And we can certainly do that um, and we often do. But sometimes our understanding of our code and what the code is actually doing are not the same. And in those cases, we want to allow the debugger to show us exactly what's happening as the code executes. So we begin by telling the debugger to stop executing at a certain place. And we call this place a breakpoint. The breakpoint is going to be a place, a stopping point a place where we tell the debugger, I want you to pause right here and wait for my next instruction. So we set a breakpoint on any line where we would like the code to pause so that we can begin evaluating what's going on. It doesn't need to be the top of the code. It could be somewhere in the middle. It really depends on which part of the code you want to scrutinize and evaluate. One limitation that I'll mention is that you can't put a breakpoint on the first line of code. You can, but the debugger won't honor it. When it first runs into this code, it'll skip over the breakpoint. So we need to set a breakpoint that's at at least the second line of code. You set the breakpoint by clicking the, the alleyway here between the line number and the code line. So it's very simple. You can set as many as you'd like uh, and you can toggle them on and off. We'll set ours at counter here so that we can get a load of what's happening while the while loop executes over and over again. The next step after setting the breakpoint is to run the debugger. And that's as simple as right clicking in the code window, the way I'm doing here, and choosing debug. It's right next to run, it's debug. Of course, you need to have a breakpoint for it to work, otherwise the debugger will simply run your code for you all the way through. What we've done here is we've set the breakpoint on line 10, and when we run the debugger, we see that that line is highlighted in blue. What this indicates is that this is the next code line to be executed. You see, PyCharm now has paused execution right on this line, and now we have the opportunity to step through the code line by line, step by step, as, as gradually as we wish, and examine what's happening with the code. So you see it's an invaluable tool for getting visibility on what your code is doing.
we uh, notice that once we've started the debugger and it pauses at the breakpoint, special panels at the bottom have now appeared. These are not the run window, which we would normally see, but instead the, the debug panels up here at the top of this panel, you see debug. Uh, we see uh, new, uh, new buttons like debugger and console. We see a series of icons here. Uh, on the lower right, we see the variables panel. Let's take a look at that variables panel. You see how it says max val equals four int four. This is indicating that this variable has this value and it is of this type. And this value would change if this variable uh, changed. We'll see a changed variable in a minute. This is the variables inspector and it's gonna show us all our variables, their type and value. And as I mentioned, we always need to know that and that's the reason that the debugger uh, is showing that to us. In addition, you may notice that there is a very convenient notation here at the top that shows the current value of this variable. It's just a very visual um, uh, a convenience to show us this since, of course, the same information is down here. I noticed some new features in PyCharm they keep adding every year um, that allows you to click here and it says add as inline watch or set value. I'm sure set value will actually let you change the value yourself while the code is still executing, but I'm not quite sure what add as inline watch means. We're going to look at a very small subset of what the debugger can do. It's still a very valuable one. Okay, our next step is now to step through the code statement by statement. And we look down here to the icons that are here. To the right of debugger and console, we have a hamburger icon, a broken arrow, a down arrow, and a down arrow with three little lines. Those three little lines um, uh, are part of this icon and they indicate step into my code. You'll see as you roll over each one, as you uh, uh, mouse over each one, each one has a name. This one is step into my code and it's the one we're going to focus on. We'll go ahead and click that uh, button once. Doing so, you'll notice that the blue line, the highlighted line, is now dropped down one line. That indicates that this line is the next one to be executed. And notice that counter now has a value. So because we executed line 10, counter now has a value. And down here, you'll notice <clears throat> that it's also represented in the variables panel. Now, of course, what we're interested in doing is seeing the while loop in action. And that's going to consist of the two main aspects uh, of our awareness, which is which line will be executed next and what are the values of variables as the code progresses. So we'll click again into a uh, step into my code and we see that the two variables have retained their values, but we did see that the, the test in line 11 was true <clears throat> because it entered the code. <clears throat> and we now go further to the next line PyCharm is pushing down the code, uh, making it a little less clear, but there it is. It, we're about to execute line 13, and we see that counter, uh, the value of counter has now progressed to one, and that's because, of course, in line 12, we added one to it and assigned it back to the, word, to the name counter. So you see that as we execute, the values may change, and if they change, the notation up here will change, and also the variable inspector value will be reported here too. Now the next thing I'm going to do is, is uh, step into my code again, and my anticipation is that uh, the next line that will be executed will be line 10, the one at the top. I'm at line 13 now. I'm going to execute the next line, so let's do it. Okay, sorry, not line 10, line 11. It takes us up to line 11. Uh, and shows us uh, that we are now about to evaluate this test again. Uh, we ourselves can look at the values and say, oh yeah, counter is one, max val is four, therefore this will be true. And so I predicted that the next line will be line 12. And it can be really, really helpful for you to ask yourself if you know what's about to happen. Because eventually we want to be able to do this kind of debugging ourselves in our own minds. We're already starting to do that a little bit, but eventually most or you know, all coders will look at their code and say, okay, now this will be this and this will happen next, and this is what's going to be the value next time I let's say go to the next line. That is an important awareness that every coder must have. And the debugger is giving us a chance to witness this so we can start to build it into our awareness.
Now, I guess the next question would be, which line will be next and what will the value of counter be? If, um, if line 12 is the line I'm about to execute, I think we can pretty reasonably say that counter will be two and the next line to be executed will be 13. Let's go. Okay, great. Let's ask that question again. Which line will be executed next? I would say line 11, right? Sure, there it is, line 11. And so we continue executing, watching the value of counter as it executes until finally it becomes four. And I think we know which line is next. From line 13, we go back to line 11. And then what's gonna be after that? Well, after line 11, it looks like we're done because if this test is false, which it is, we would drop down below this code to the line below. We actually don't have any more code lines. So this means that the debugger will conclude. Actually, I usually like to do it this way with an extra line in here. So I'm gonna add this. I'm gonna run the debugger again. And so you have the choice, of course, of stepping through the code as quickly or as briefly as you wish. And here we are now at four, counter is four, we're in line 11, so the question is which line is next? It is likely to be 15, is it not? And we're dropped down to 15. You can, as I say, you can step through the code as quickly or as gradually as you wish. You can pause it at any time or allow it to stay paused while you think about the variables and how they're being executed and how they're changing as the code executes. So that is the main use of the debugger. It's a basic tool that actually has a lot, I'm sure, several more very useful features uh, that you may find you know, fr uh, 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 useful to you in the future. However, I'm just focusing on just this basic use of the debugger. However, there are two main snags that I've seen us run into that I would like to discuss. One is the use of input. So let's imagine that instead of, um, instead of uh, uh, hard coding this max val, I were to take it as an input. And I would say, input, please enter a max value. And then um, max val equals int of max val. Let's say that. Okay, now we have a slightly more complex pro, uh, program and we can put our, uh, uh, our debugging step here. Um, Actually, let's see what happens when we run that one in the debugger. Okay, the other one was still running, so I'll stop it. Okay, this works okay because it says, please enter a max value, but you'll notice that the, um, the prompt actually changes a little bit. I'm not sure why they do this, uh, but we could go ahead and, uh, and enter that, and then we could just say, keep going, or let's execute, and it'll keep going until it's three, and then it'll be done. But it can be even more uh, 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 difficult if the input statement is later on in the code, after we've started the debugger and after we've set a breakpoint. So let's, uh, let's ask this question. Um, why don't I just say that if the user types Y to break, uh, it will break out of the code. Okay. Now the big problem here is that if I say the uh, set the breakpoint here and I start the debugger, what we see, of course, is what we would expect initially, which is that the code executes, uh, it stops at a breakpoint, and uh, we now have the opportunity to uh, to start executing our code and uh, and going statement by statement. But something strange and disorienting happens when we see input because, well, I don't even see it being highlighted here, but um, presumably we're in the debugger part and I'm sorry, we've started the debugger and we passed the breakpoint, although it does not show that and that we're on line 10. Let's check the console here. No, not yet. Okay, so let's uh, step in another line. Okay, now I'm seeing a lightning strike here, whatever that means. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Let's look at the console. Maxvel is not defined. Ah, there was an error. Okay, so I made a mistake. All right, let's try it again. By the way, if you ever need to stop the debugger in the middle, just hit the red button to stop it. Uh, I'll say uh, maxval. Hmm. 
equals uh, three. And let's run the debugger again. Okay, great. We've stopped at line 10. That's the way it should be. Let's step into our code. Okay, and now we're uh, about to execute line 11, which in which we take user input. Let's execute that. Okay, this is where things get strange because the input function, of course, requires that we do keyboard input. But if the debugger is controlling, it can't really do that. In fact, temporarily, the debugger has to relinquish control. And so what we're seeing here is that the debugger goes blank. And this can be very confusing because it sort of looks like the debugger is done, but it's not. Instead, it's turned over control to the input function. And what we need to do is click on console and answer the input functions request here. So here we can say maybe n and enter. And now we're back to the debugger. We can go to the debugger panel. So in these cases where you're using input dynamically within a debugger session, you need to toggle back and forth between the console, where you can do your inputting, and the debugger. Now we can continue our journey uh, by uh, 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 executing the code line by line, allowing it to come back up. But again, when we get to this input line, um, we're going to need to go back to console. And this time we can, let's say, type Y, and I'll hit Enter. And now we go back to the debugger console. And now the question would be, which line is next? It looks like the next line will be uh, line 13. And then from 13, we should jump to 17 because we hit a break statement. So the lesson in this section is that when you're working with input, you may need to click over to console to answer the input and then back to debugger to go back to your debugger session. There's one other thing. I'm just going to complete this. One other thing I'm going to mention that I just noticed, I thought it was a bug that had been fixed, uh, is when I run this debugger again and we step on into the code, we again have to go to console, put in, let's say, n, go to debugger, keep going, I notice that when we are here on line 15, we're about to jump back up, that inexplicably, the debugger appears to go up to line 9. Now, I don't believe it's actually going to execute line 9, um, but it does jump up there for some strange reason. I'm not sure why it seems to be a bug. We didn't see it in the previous example, but that's just something you have to just work with. Just keep hitting uh, step into my code until you get down to executing the line that you want. As I mentioned, or as we demonstrated before, if you attempt to do some sort of debugging session while you're still in the middle of one, it'll ask you whether you'd like to stop. Um, you can choose to stop there, or you can choose to stop by clicking the, black, the red uh, square. Now, in some cases, I suggest that if input is uh, slowing you down as far as the debugger goes, consider just giving it a hard-coded value. That wouldn't really be appropriate here, but you know you could always choose to just you know say n or say y or whatever, and have you know just replace the input function there, and then restore it later when you're ready uh, to finalize your code. Now there's one last little snag that you may run into, and this isn't something we discuss until later in the intro course, but it's the use of sysargv. Now I'm not going to go into the use of sysargv, but needless to say that sysargv attempts to read from the command line, and it's something, as I say, we're going to go into later, um, unless we've, you know, you've already uh, learned about it. Um, and in those cases, we might be saying something like this, where we're expecting a value to come from the command line. Now, if you haven't worked with this yet, it's not important, but I will say that if you need to stay off the command line because you're running through the debugger, you can easily fix that by simply changing the value of the... Um, of the list that is in sysargv. Oops, 
change the value of that list so that you don't need to read from sysarg you can just hard code what's in there now this won't make any sense to you until later or until after you've been exposed to the command line and the use of sysarg but i did want to mention it here in this video